Hello and welcome back to the Long Island Railroad Montauk Branch. Today we're going to join uh, Extra 1501 idling here on the passing siding and service the team track and Canover paper with a few boxcars. Now I've been making a lot of changes on the railroad, so let's see what happens as we take the crossing onto the main line. I'm going to do this live. So, pardon me if my narration is the spotty, whatever you want to call it. Okay, we're just traveling along, passing by the industries in Blissville, entering the main line. And coming up to, wait, what's this? What's going on? Oh, the team track has moved. Look at that. Team track is here where Marlin Siding used to be, or Marlin Warehouse. Huh, but wait, we were going to service Marlin Warehouse. Well, I guess we'll do that on the way back. Okay. Just proceeding along the waterfront, still the same. Oh, look, there's a house floating in the water. Oh my God, look at that guy walking on water. A bunch of crap floating in the water. Coming around the corner. Oh, what's going on here? Look at this. Major changes back here. All right, let me go over and tell you what I've done. Enough with this foolishness. Well, I decided after watching other people's videos and thinking really hard about what I wanted to do on my railroad to change things up, I decided I am going to institute Operation Waterfront. What I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the fascia out six inches and fill in this whole area all the way across with a waterfront six inches deep. Yeah, excuse you. So I've already started working on it. Uh, before I extended the fascia, I figured I'd better work on the back corners, otherwise it'd just be too hard to get to. So the first thing I did was that I took everything that used to be in this area and I combined it all. It's now one industry and I decided it would be Canover paper. So I took the original Canover paper and basically turned it inside out. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you can see the bottom level on the left there is what used to be the inside of Canover paper that you could see through my little peephole. Well, I tore that out. Oh, I also decided I didn't like the way I had painted the backs of some buildings green to match the fascia. I just didn't think it worked. It was, it was a distraction more than anything else. So I got rid of all that. And okay, so I took the inside and moved it over there. Let me turn the lights on added some lights. I took the outside of Canover paper and glued it to the top of the inside. So now it's a two level effect. And I took the other half of the outside and put it over there on that side to kind of join the two halves of the buildings together. Cause this used to be the old uh, Howard rubber. And, but now it's also part of Canover paper. So the old part, the new part. Uh, and then I have a, I had built an overpass and I decided I didn't like it the way it was. So I actually cut it in half and glued it into the corner there to get some so even more verticalness. Cause that's one thing that my railroad really lacks is verticalness. It's got a lot of horizontalness for lack of a better term, but not a lot of verticalness. So I'm going to try to fix that. Uh, now I can't really do like downtown New York city because this isn't, this is Brooklyn. Everything was one or two stories in this area. Uh, but I decided, I'm not going to so slavishly devote myself to modeling the prototype. I'm going to do what I want, taking cues from the prototype. So since this area, the blissful area back there is, it's really close to the prototype. You know, all the buildings match pretty much. I'll leave that the way it is. And I can take pleasure in the fact that I modeled that pretty well. 
And then for the rest of it, I'm going to do what I want. So the first step of Operation Waterfront was get this corner done, which I've done. Now, I've done a lot of really neat little things. Um, well, I had to take all the light poles out and rearrange them to match the road because I tore the road out. I built the big parking pad there, tore the road out that used to go down here. And this probably can't tell what I'm doing. And I've moved Marlin Warehouse over here. So it's going to be right on the waterfront served by the, the rail railroad. And I've uh, been laying balsa wood. Actually, this is basswood. And the strip down the middle is balsa wood because it's easier to, to trim to make it fit. And that's going to go all the way across the front. So you can see this is what I'm currently working on. I have it pinned in place while it's drying. And that's going to go, like I said, all the way down. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, I extended this siding a little bit, and I did something that I saw on uh, Paul Dolkos's layout, the Baltimore Harbor District. Uh, there's a series of articles that you can download off of the Model Railroader website, which if you enjoy Harbor Districts, uh, I, so I highly recommend you get it. Paul Dolkos is a great modeler, and he's got a lot of good ideas. So what I did is I did stole his half a boxcar idea. See this boxcar? Well, that's it. It's only half a boxcar. Uh, this is an old one that didn't work. Uh, I got it at a train show, obviously. And uh, it just didn't work. So it wasn't well weighted. It didn't balance well, whatever. So I cut it in half and stuck it in there. And I uh, fixed the coupler so it looks like it couples, but it doesn't. You can't really couple to it. So it doesn't actually get dragged out of the uh, it's a little hole in the wall there. So what else did I do over here? Oh, the uh, um, the dock, the loading dock there. Uh, a everything to the right. You see where the staircase is. Everything under that, you can just see where the line joins. I made to match the existing one. I made it all out of styrene, and I'm pretty happy with that. I think it came out pretty well. So, pat myself on the shoulder there, but whatever. And then I made these two little tanks of whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, out of... Um, yes, thank you. God, everything's making noise. Uh, PVC pipe, and add a little fence to it. So, I, I like it. And then I took the, uh, the structure that used to be here, and it's still here, but I had to, I rearranged it and I made it more like the way it was supposed to be as a uh, straight out of the kit background, you know, um, yeah, background model. What do I call it? Backdrop. And then I took the building, a non rail served building that used to be here where the sanding sponge is, tore it apart and took its functional walls and glued them to the top of that to add a little more verticality to that. And then that pipe came off of the, uh, the overpass that I cut up, the red pipe, I just glued it there. And uh, had to redo the parking lot and whatnot, but this is better now because now there's room to park the trucks there in a, in a logical way that they actually have room. So, and then I had to, uh, I decided I would do some concrete modeling as a test, so I put the uh, road crossing there, uh, made it out of uh, it's actually balsa or basswood and balsa wood, just like this is over here, uh, and modeled it out of modeled it into concrete, painted it like concrete. There, we focused. And the thing I've been working on the last couple of days, slaving over, uh, to get ready for this video, was putting the balsa wood down here in the front, so you could see what it looked like, and get the Marlin warehouse in place. Now I did a lot of work on the Marlin warehouse because this was the backside that you couldn't see. And now it's the front side. And so I added some doodads and uh, changed the doors, the big cargo doors out, uh, so they looked a little bit better. And that's all I've done so far. I don't plan on changing any of that building. This building I'm going to add uh, a second story to, to give it some more verticality, like I said. Now, one of the big things I did was I added this crossover. So now this siding will go down there. <laughs> But then now I have a new siding that's going to go do the same thing, curve down and go all the way down here. 
and I'll get to what's going to go there shortly. And so as long as I was adding uh, switches and whatnot, I did the onerous task of upgrading all the switches in here with the blue point switch machines. Machines, I can't talk either. So now I can switch them all with blue point switch machines. Got my hand under the table, flipping the machine there. I haven't put in the activating mechanism because there's no point since there's going to be the face is going to be out here when it's, once I put it in. So I'm just going to wait till I get that all done before I put in the activation rods. So what's going to happen here for the rest of Operation Waterfront? This is going to be just a nondescript building, um, storage building, whatever. But the rest of the layout is going to be completely remodeled. I'm going to reuse the buildings as much as I can, obviously. And it's going to be, I was thinking, what can I put there? What industry in this area would work as a waterfront industry? And then it suddenly hit me, something, I mean, it was right in my face all the time. The Phelps Dodge Copper Refinery. So, here's a little background on the Phelps Dodge Copper Refinery. This incredible picture of the Phelps Dodge Copper Refinery was taken in 1951. I have studied it closely and will be talking about some of the details. That is to say, there's a lot of neat details I won't be talking about, so if you have a question on something, or could point something out, please comment and I'll try to address it in the future video. The Phelps Dodge Refinery on the Newton Creek was the Lure's largest customer. I don't have data for the mid-60s, but in 1973 it received 1,960 cars, and in 1977, 2,539. That's about 211 cars a month. There's no reason to believe it would be any less in the mid-1960s. I've done some research on copper refining in general, and this refinery specifically, and tried to work out how it interacted with the various transportation methods. The first thing to know about copper refining is that copper ore, straight out of the ground, is not more than 2% copper, and usually much less. Thus, a lot of refining is done on-site to avoid transportation costs on what is essentially garbage. If shipped at all, ore is shipped as what is called concentrate, that is 25 to 40 percent pure. This is generally gravel-sized or smaller. The Phelps Dodge Refinery did process copper ore, and you can see here in the picture a number of gondolas being unloaded by cranes. Why gondolas and not hoppers, I don't know. Perhaps hoppers weren't as prevalent in 1951. The ore goes into a furnace, which I believe is this structure right here. The preferred way to ship copper was as anodes. A single anode is a sheet three feet wide and three and a half feet tall, two inches thick with handles molded into the top. Each anode weighed 750 pounds. So a standard 40 foot boxcar could carry about 130 of them a line of which would be about 22 feet long. You can see in this picture again a number of boxcars being unloaded, apparently with cranes and forklifts. It also appears that trucks are used to move the anodes to the electrolysis tanks. Anodes like this were about 95% pure. They were subject to two weeks of electrolysis and emerged as 99.99% .99 pure cathodes. The electrolysis tanks are up here in this area as far as I can tell. Anodes were also delivered by barge. In a complicated process, anodes were delivered by the Baltimore and Ohio, loaded on a barge, and moved to the refinery. This picture shows a number of anodes on a barge, awaiting its trip up to the Newton Creek. Be aware that this picture was taken in 1978. You can see up in this corner a barge loaded with anodes. Note that the picture is from 1951 and the barge is a stick lighter capable of self-unloading. The anodes were loaded onto small flat cars of the facility's in-house narrow-gauge railroad. Each of these little cars could carry about 30 anodes or 22,500 pounds. The facility also received coal by barge to fire its furnace and, I assume, a power plant. All the electrolysis must have needed a lot of power. It appears that all of their coal was received via barge and moved via the narrow gauge railroad. This area here shows where the coal was handled and a fascinating bit of elevated track for moving the coal to the big pile here and probably to the furnace here as mentioned before. 
I assume the narrow gauge railroad was also used to move coal to the power plant, which I assume is way back here. Once the copper was processed, it could leave the facility in several forms. It could leave as plain cathodes, as large ingots, or as wire. This implies that the facility had rolling and drawing mills, which could be any one of the large sheds on the property. As far as I can tell, it all departed via boxcars, but by my time period, early coil cars might be used, and I see no reason why gondolas and flat cars couldn't be used either. Okay, enough history and conjecture. So how am I going to model all this? Clearly I can't model the whole operation, and my layout size and track plan, which I'm not going to change, dictate that I can't even come close to matching the arrangement. So I decided I will model those things that appeal to me, the waterfront operations and the narrow gauge railway. Who could resist? So I put together, wait for it, a flowchart to help me organize my plan. So on the left is the process for receiving copper anodes. On the right, copper ore, and in the center, coal. The green boxes show all the transportation actions that I plan on modeling. The anodes arrive by rail and barge, are unloaded by cranes, and moved by the narrow gauge railroad. The refined copper comes out as cathodes, ingots, or wire, all of which are loaded by crane and transported by rail. The ore arrives by rail in concentrate form and is refined through multiple steps until anodes are produced, which are then processed like the other anodes. The coal arrives via barge, is unloaded by crane, and is moved by the narrow gauge railroad. Obviously, the vast majority of this action will happening off board. Fortunately, I can maximize exposure of the waterfront and the narrow gauge railway activity at the front edge of my train board. All right, I hope that wasn't too incredibly boring for you, but uh, that's the plan. Now, where exactly are things going to go? I'm not sure. What I think I'm going to do is right here is like I'm going to use this new siding as the arrival point for the copper, the copper anodes. And I'm going to move this building around, change it a little bit. Sorry, you can't see where I'm pointing, I'm waving my hand around and you can't see it. Uh, this will be the arrival point for the copper ore. And I'll, I'll take the building apart and stretch it out and make it longer. Um, this long building will be probably the uh, departure point for the copper anodes. And I'm going to build a lot more on top of it and try to make it, you know, put pipes and stuff, try to make it neat, which may not be realistic, but it's, it's what I want. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and then moving down, unfortunately, uh, King's Concrete going to have to go. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to move it over to the back corner back there. And it's going to replace, come on, focus. It's going to replace um, from and Seschel because that building's just made of cardboard. Well, not cardboard, foam board. And the overhead crane that you see there, I'll move over here along with the new building that I'm going to have to make. And this will be the departure point for uh, coil and ingots, because the overhead crane will be there to lift it into uh, gondolas or flat cars or even coil cars. Uh, I got another switch. I'm going to put it in here, so there'll be two sidings there for that. Um, and then what's going to happen here, this siding, is, I don't know, <laughs> it may just be a storage siding and I may just build a big long shed here. I haven't decided. But, you know, I can decide in the future. I have that going for me. Uh, all my neat stuff that I've made here will be broken up and reused because I'm definitely going to reuse everything. I would love to reuse these. Not, I'll find something to do with that building. I don't know what. But these are so glued down, I may not be able to get them off uh, so they still work. Um, however, the coaling facility is going to be right in this general area. I hope. So it's possible I could just like turn them around, paint them black and make them coal, which is something I'm seriously considering. And then where this is over here, uh, I may make into the slag heap with big pipes of slag coming out of the wall and slag boiling out. And I don't know if it's that dramatic, but maybe this will be where the slag goes. So that's 
So, what else? Oh yeah, and the uh, the the uh, narrow gauge railroad. I am so excited about doing that. Uh, the actual narrow gauge railroad is um, twenty one inch gauge, and I'm not going to do that. I am not that good. I am not going to hand lay track. I'll do whatever the the version that uses N gauge track is, which I think is O N thirty or not O N H O N thirty. And I went online, and there are actually a lot of uh, HO N30 cars available that will suit my purposes. There are coal cars that are perfect, and I'm sure I'll be able to find some flat cars. And if not, I'm pretty sure I can make them. I don't need that many. And I'll, I'll be able to find a, a small engine to pull it to. So what's going to happen is the narrow gauge will start here, and it'll actually it'll be flat, and then it'll rise up through here, so I can make it over these tracks. And then part of it will branch over here to the coal, and another part will branch over here to take the anodes into the uh, processing, because the um, electrolysis tanks are all going to be in the back, back there somewhere, off off board. I'll try to get a backdrop that works, and then this is going to be the furnace area. So the coal will go here, and then it'll have to do a, a double back into the furnace. So it'll add extra ops on a completely different railroad, which I think is a really cool concept. It won't be that many. I mean, they'll just be moving a few cars of uh, anodes around and a few cars of coil, coil, coal around. But it'll be neat. And I'm also thinking I'll use, uh, I'll take one of my um, GE engines and use it as a plant switcher over here. But we'll see. This is months down the road. It's going to take a while. So... Okay, there's one more thing I want to tell want to tell you, show you, whatever. All right, I teased this earlier. Um, this is going to be my it's a my version of a, a burrow crane. Um, it's as, it's as close as I could get it. But what I did was I took an old uh, probably Tyco maybe Atlas crane car, and when I say old, I mean old. I had it I've had it forever, like 45 years, and I cut it up. I cut it in. Basically, cut the middle out of the cab and glued the two ends back together. I cut the very end off of the boom because it was a uh, originally, it was like you know, every other crane car you've seen where there was a heavy lift and a, a light lift hook. And I cut it out the uh, extension for the light lift hook and just used the heavy lift area. Uh, and then this is actually harder, the, um, the car part. I don't know what you'd call it, the base that it rides on. I had to cut that in, in thirds. Uh, I took the two ends and uh, cut out the bits in between the ends in the middle and then glued the ends back on the middle and then made it ride on one truck. Uh, the truck could be bigger, but at least it's a three axle truck. So it's got that going for it. And then I um, obviously wired it. It's just a thread. It, uh, it's not... <laughs> It's not motorized. You got to push it around, but at least the uh, the crane, the cab does turn. Now it's a little sticky. Whatever. All right, I'm not going to do it. But that's because, as I explained, the uh, Phelps Dodd uses a whole lot of cranes. Now there aren't really a lot of uh, cranes on trucks available that I've seen on the market. So we'll see what I use. But this will be able to drive down the tracks and. I was thinking I'd get a, a overhead crane that rides on tracks, but I really don't have quite enough room here for it. So it, it may still happen, but we'll see. So all this is going to have to go so I can get this out of the way. And I guess that's all I'm going to tell you about my update. So stay tuned in, in the future and we'll see what happens. Now let's get back to the switching. Yeah, I haven't forgot about that. All right. Now I... I haven't forgot about the switching, but I just noticed that this video is already almost 25 minutes long. So I'm going to end it here. Haha, ha, I fooled you. <laughs> Fake. But I'll have uh, part two of the switching probably done by tomorrow or the next day. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned for part two, and I'll see you next time on the Long Island Railroad Montauk Branch. I should make a theme song. A little jingle. Oh, I already got it. I mean, I'm babbling. Jesus. Tell me to shut up. Okay, see you next time. Bye.